This is AUGforums.com Real Talk, an unfiltered, independent perspective on Acumatica Cloud ERP. My name is Tim Rodman, and I want to mention three things in this pre recorded intro before we get started. First, thank you to our sponsors. Our first sponsor is Paya. Paya offers Acumatica users a suite of industry-leading payment orchestration tools. Far beyond native Acumatica payments, Paya enables EMV, NFC terminals for counter sale. They offer a frictionless customer portal through their click-to-pay solution, and they support most e-commerce platforms and point-of-sale solutions used with Acumatica such as One Retail and AccuPOS. And best of all, Omnichannel Reconciliation is available for all of their solutions. Our second sponsor is DataSelf. DataSelf Analytics is a revolutionary reporting solution that enables organizations to make the most informed decisions faster and easier than ever. It uniquely simplifies business intelligence, empowers anyone to build and access dashboards, and delivers critical business insight when and where you need it. Our third sponsor is 24-7 Digitize. 24-7 Digitize is an Acumatica bookkeeping service provider that helps derive the best value from your Acumatica investment by maintaining your books utilizing Acumatica's best practices and guidelines. Please take a minute to support this podcast by clicking each one of the sponsor banners located at augforums.com slash sponsors. Our sponsors track clicks and every click helps to support this podcast. The second thing I'd like to mention is that I'm always looking for victims. <clears throat> I mean, guests. If you use Acumatica in any capacity, no matter how small, I'd love to talk with you. Check out augforums.com slash podcast and click the link near the top of the page to learn more about being a guest on the podcast. Third and finally, I'd love to see you listed on my Rolodex. Check out augforums.com slash Rolodex to find out who else is using Acumatica and read the instructions at the top to see how you can add yourself to the list. All right, that's it for the pre-recorded intro. Let's get started. Today is Wednesday, September 28th, 2022, and this is episode number 99, Josh Fisher preview of Shopify B2B integration with Acumatica. Hey, Josh, thanks for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Hey, before we get into our topic, I always like to uh, get the what I call the brief origin story of all of our guests. So maybe you could tell us like where you grew up, where you went to school and how you got into the world of ERP systems. OK, how, how brief should I be? Um, so so up I'll, to you. Up I'll to you. start out. <laughs> I, I grew up in uh, Western Maryland. So like right in the panhandle of Maryland, where it gets the thinnest, that's where I grew up. And um, I studied art in uh, high school. I was really into art. And I ended up getting a full ride to UMBC, which is the University of Maryland in Baltimore County, for my art. And otherwise, I wouldn't have gone to college. Um, moved down to Baltimore, and I studied art there. But they, it was a technical school. So it wasn't painting and sculpture. It was Photoshop and Flash and how to do digital video editing and things like that. So I got a lot of exposure to this new form of communication at that time. And then I graduate, um, um, I studied a little bit of computer work there, but I I was really into coding action script. I really liked using Flash to create these experiences. Um, and I would and I would do that for the artwork and I would do it for clients, too. So when I graduated school, I mean, there was no help wanted ads for artists. So I ended up building out websites and that's how I made my money. So almost right out of school, I was doing freelance gigs for everybody. And um, 
eventually, right around 2008, when things started to get rough, I took a corporate job uh, with a very large civil engineering company, and I was on their marketing team. Um, and I helped them build out websites and web-based marketing materials um, for helping them close deals. They, they used to think of themselves as like the Mercedes Benz of civil engineering. They would do everything from, you know, um, mixed use environments in cities and um, uh, they would work on roads and everything. But they had to build relationships with the community so the community would trust them to come in and make these massive alterations to the um, environment where the community was. So web tools were really important to that, forums and things like that. Eventually left there and I started my own digital agency. So at the digital agency, we were working a lot with nonprofits and e-commerce businesses and just building out websites, um, helping people with their branding strategy online, helping them understand why social media was important. Um, and really I started seeing more and more e-commerce gigs come in. So 2008, 2010, that's right around the time Shopify was becoming popular. So everybody wanted to start selling online. And that's how I got my introduction to Shopify. So I, um, in 2010, 2012, I was building out Shopify sites. I owned a Shopify business with a couple partners and um, everything was going really well. 2012, I meet the owner of another ERP, a small open source, mainly manufacturing ERP uh, business. And um, he made this comment that, you know, the world of e-commerce is really important. Everybody's going to adopt it, but nobody is focused on integrating e-commerce with ERP systems. And as all these e-commerce businesses grow, they're going to need an ERP. And if there aren't integrations, then, you know, they're going to be in a really bad situation. So he ended up, we spent a year building an integration to his ERP between Drupal Commerce and um, uh, th this platform. Um, and it went really well. We went to a conference, we demoed it, we announced that we were doing this, you know, it was officially a product, it was really just a prototype, but we were pitching it like it was a final product. And as soon as the session was over, there's like a single file line of people that wanted to talk with us. After the conference, I get a phone call from him two weeks later, he wants to acquire the agency and he wants my team to move in and we're just gonna crank out these e-commerce sites for all these manufacturers. Um, so I did that for a couple of years and learned, that's where I learned about ERP. I got thrown into the weeds with these manufacturers and I got my head wrapped around their business. Um, and eventually things started to wind down there and I got a call from Acumatica and um, they were looking for somebody with a e-commerce background and uh, they were hoping they could come in and start this new, you know, what is now the retail commerce edition. So in 2018, I got started with Acumatica. I basically walked in the door and um, I knew exactly what needed to be done. So we just got to work. It was great. Quickly built a relationship with Big Commerce, and um, um, I I had not worked with Big Commerce very much before Acumatica, but I'd known of them. I'd done a couple trial stores and tested it out. But um, man, when I got on the phone with Big Commerce and I realized where they sat in the e-commerce space. Their API was strong, our API was strong. Everything I wanted to do was at my fingertips. So we started building out the team and um, you know, I guess the rest is uh, history as they say. Well, not, not quite, we're still, we're still building up things and more integrations. I guess we have 10 more years before I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're making history. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, hopefully, yeah. I, I'm curious on the, the manufacturing one. You mentioned you kind of got in, I'm using my words, you got in the door with Shopify. Did you find it was a similar situation to what you're doing now with Acumatica and that you started with Shopify, but when you had that line of people, were you just like Shopify, 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 or did you eventually no. realize, oh, for this situation, we need a different store, same ERP on the back end, but did you start to diversify the e-commerce on the front end? Yeah, we, we, we used, um, there's a content management system called Drupal, Drupal is very similar to WordPress, but it's it's much more enterprise focused. And it's um, uh, developers prefer Drupal over WordPress because it's a little bit more organized. It's not perfect, but Drupal had a module called Drupal Commerce. Uh, it's 100% open source and you could flex 
Drupal Commerce into whatever you need it to be. Very similar to Magento. If I had it to do all over again, I probably would have worked with Magento. But um, Drupal Commerce was the platform that myself and my lead developer knew really well. And uh, with manufacturers, at that time, there were no e-commerce platforms that were affordable and as flexible as what manufacturers needed. So what we would do is sit down with like 10 different manufacturers and understand where their needs overlapped. And then we would, we built our own distribution of Drupal, which is basically our version of Drupal that uh, met those needs and had the integration to the ERP. So when a customer would come to us, we would just roll out this whole uh, unified system for them. And then, um, you know, we would do a little bit of marketing work and design work for them, but we're mainly focused on customer experience. So like when you're, when your buyer needs to, um, you know, basically you're selling assembled manufactured products, they need to communicate a lot of information to you to get that order right. So let's figure out what that looks like and build to spec. So we're going to get to Shopify B2B, but still not there yet. I, I'm curious. I've always wondered this exact thing. I didn't realize you came from the manufacturing side of things. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered, and I don't know, you, you would you would probably know, is there a VAR out there or how would you approach it for exactly a manufacturer? Because it just, it blows my mind that you've got so many manufacturing companies. Acumatica has many of them as customers and they're still doing things like, you know, phone calls, taking orders primarily not through the web, right? Sure. Like if you yeah. were... Do you know a VAR who's doing this? Or if you were a VAR, how would you approach it now? Would you use Drupal or you said Magento? Would you use Shopify B2B? What would you build specifically for a manufacturer who's on Acumatica? So there's there's a couple different stages that a manufacturer could be in with this online journey. If you're just getting started, like if you just want to dip your toe in the e-commerce space to prove that it'll actually work. Because what I've found is with, within manufacturing organizations, the leadership is still not, um, the leadership still isn't 100% married to the idea that the internet is important, right? And, and a lot of times they feel that their products are too complex to sell online. They need to have right. the, the relationships with the customers. We need to sit down face to face in order for the customer to understand. What they're not um, recognizing though is that more than 70% of B2B buyers do not want that. They, they want to be able to just Google whatever product it is they need. And it could be you know, B2B office supplies, or it could be a CNC laser cutter for your warehouse, right? People want to use the internet to learn about these products. And if you're not providing that information online, like you're completely missing those customers or those prospects. Um, so even if you're and, not going to And even sell, if you're not, do, do you feel like, I've always felt like phase one could even be before that. Phase one could be give your salespeople a true e-commerce platform to enter orders. That mm -hmm. way, if someone wants to, they could use the same platform. You know, you don't even have to sell it as yeah. you have to get people ordering. Just order internally through the platform and then you're set up to add people to the platform if you want. Yeah, that's exactly right. So like, even if you're not going to sell on the platform, just get your information online so that people can find you. And maybe maybe instead of having add to cart buttons, you just have a call for quote button or something like this. But people, they want to pull their phone out of their pocket and find exactly what they're looking for as quickly as possible. And you need to be the first person that they find. And then they, you know, buyers prefer to do their own research online. There's actually data that shows that buyers, B2B buyers, want to do 80 percent of the research on their own and then that last 20 percent possibly engage with a salesperson and that's when they're asking the deep hard-hitting questions and they're maybe comparing two products or they're getting specifications or referrals or whatever information that they can only get from a salesperson but it's just that last 20 percent and the thing is what manufacturers need to understand is think about all the time that saves their salespeople instead of the salespeople on the phone taking orders or answering the same repetitive questions over and over again, now the salesperson has all this time to go build stronger relationships with buyers or go find new buyers. And they can actually become a consultant to the buyers. So they'll sit down and understand all the challenges that the, that the buyer has within their business. And then they can introduce products and like go through a proper uh, sales cycle rather than just 
you know, phone rings, you take an order, you hang up, phone rings again. I mean, that's just, that's not what you're paying salespeople to do. A machine can do that for you. Yeah, there's this Acumatica customer that I've been working with and curious your thoughts on this. I love his approach to it. So he's, he built out an e-commerce website. Still though, in his industry, most of it comes in through the phone, mm -hmm. but he gives his salespeople the same commission if they're, cause they, they're assigned by a customer. Yeah. Yeah. Whether they order through the website or over the phone and his word for his e-commerce website, he views it as a sales assistant. Yeah. You know, it's kind of the same thing, like take care of the mechanics. So he incentivizes his salespeople to drive them through the website. They'll get the same percentage. I think it's a cool approach. What do oh you think? yeah. I told, I totally agree. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the website is just like you said, it's a sales assistant or a sales tool. You know, whenever a customer calls in, they have specific questions. If you have like a templated email inside your inbox with all the links to the product information, somebody calls you and says, I need more information on this. You just shoot off that email that links them to the website where they can download PDFs or watch videos or see whatever information they need. That, uh, to your point, becomes an assistant that is helping you with the sales process. It shouldn't matter where they actually convert. If they convert on the phone, that's great. If they convert online, that's, in my opinion, even better. But the salesperson is the one that's kind of the foundation of that relationship. And yeah, they shouldn't be, there's no reason that you would want to motivate your sales team to push customers to order things over the phone, right? If anything, it's better if they're placing these orders online. And think about all the data and all the analytics you're going to get. If everybody's buying from you on the website, you can see the paths that people take through your website. You can see like which products are being looked at. You can install um, you can install modules like Crazy Egg that will actually produce heat maps to show people where pe the buyers are looking on the website, where their eyes are focused, and what is the uh, path that they're taking as they're reading your content. All of that data is not possible if your salesperson is just talking on the phone. So let's say you've got a manufacturer, and I'll preface this with, this is not a consulting conversation. We don't, okay. the, theoretical thing here, right? You've got a manufacturer in that situation that you're talking about, kind of internet, eh, I'm not so sure. And so you're looking to build out a, what I'll call a proof of comma, a proof of concept commerce solution mm -hmm. for to, to kind of get them on board. What, what would you lean towards in general? Would it be the Drupal? Would it be Shopify B2B? You know, what, what tool are you starting to reach for? I'm not necessarily saying it's the one you use every time, but what do you sure. lean towards? So, so the manufacturer is going to be cost sensitive in the beginning. So they're going to, their, their first question is how much is it going to cost me? And when they go out and start observing all these different options, they're going to see Drupal and they're going to see Magento and they're going to see WordPress, which are all three open source, technically free applications. And they're going to be really attracted to that four letter word. But in my opinion, those applications have the potential to get them into trouble because they're so open and because there's so much you can do with them and there's no regulation over the security systems or anything, it can lead manufacturers down a, a difficult path, right? Those are great systems. I don't have a problem with them, but to answer your question specifically, you they should look at BigCommerce and Shopify. So BigCommerce and Shopify are both SaaS applications. They have very strong security teams, which is something you have to take seriously. And they're super intuitive. So like anybody on the manufacturer's team, you just take somebody under the age of 30 and give them the website project, right? I don't mean to knock all the work that digital agencies do, but the reality is if you're just trying to get online, you can go buy a theme for Shopify or big commerce, install it. You can update some pictures, update the content, get your products online. And I mean, within a matter of weeks, you're going to be selling products. So maybe, you know, even if I'm cost conscious, it's, it sounds to me like the point you're making is you might have less software costs with Drupal, WordPress, and Magento, but if you add software and services, you might have less total costs with big commerce and Shopify. Yeah, that's right. And at the end of the day, even you use WordPress as an example, 
Um, WordPress itself is free and you can install it, but you still have to pay for hosting. You're still going to have to pay for all the modules. You're still going to have to pay for access to the gateways. It like the dollars are still going to add up. It's still going to come in less expensive than, um, uh, that might even be debatable, but it, it likely is still going to be less expensive than big commerce or Shopify, but the security is so important. Like like Shopify and BigCommerce lock their systems down. And with WordPress, you just better hope that nothing bad happens. Sort of like the same idea of, hey, I could host Acumatica on my own. That's right. Until I get a ransomware attack and yeah. now maybe it's not such a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, well, that's cool. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up the manufacturer scenario. I've been very interested in that myself. What's your advice then for a VAR who is dealing with manufacturers? I mean, is your advice, hey, you could just hire someone who's 30 years old and under and, and kind of build that out in your practice? Or is it, hey, work with a digital agency? Yeah. What would you usually say My, to a VAR? Okay, so if I was sitting down with um, a VAR who was very knowledgeable in manufacturing, um, but they were new to this topic of selling online, I would say, number one, here's a list of digital agencies that I recommend build a relationship with them and find one that you can one or two that you partner up with really well and go to market with them. Because when you start talking to manufacturers, if somebody's in that meeting that knows anything about e-commerce, they're going to start asking questions that there's no way a VAR is prepared to answer. Like what is your SEO strategy or how do you handle marketing automation or which, e which email marketing platforms, can we integrate with like most VARs are not going to be prepared to answer those questions. And as soon as the manufacturer gets a sense that this is new territory for the VAR, it's going to be that, that feeling is going to be hard to get past later on down the road. So build a, build a relationship with a digital agency. And we, and we have agencies we work with. We'll gladly introduce them to VARs. Um, the other thing is learn about, B2B e-commerce, but also D2C. So D2C is taking off in the manufacturing world. So a lot of manufacturers are used to selling to distributors or other businesses, but what they're finding is two things happen when you go direct to consumer. One, you're reducing the middleman so you can get your products to customers faster. But actually more important to that is the relationship that you build with the customers. So like if you're Let's say you're selling um, like high-end bike. Wait, what? Yeah. One sec. Is D to C direct to consumer or distribution to consumer? Oh, sorry. I don't know. Yeah, direct to consumer. Direct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Go so, ahead. So it's the manufacturers going direct to the buyers, the consumers that are buying their products. And with, with your web presence, you can build a relationship with those customers. And ultimately the goal, like obviously you want them as customers, but as a manufacturer, you want those customers to become fans of your brand and you want them to build trust in what your brand produces. And eventually those fans, it's just like the fan of a, of a rock band, like every new album that comes out, they just go and buy it. Like there's no consideration. It's like, I know they were great in the past. They're going to be great in the future. So a manufacturer can take a very similar path with consumers. You build that kind of relationship and then you have recurring revenue every time you're coming out with new products or new offerings, whatever it may be. I have two, two thoughts that just popped in my head with that. One is, you know, like if you go back 20 years, you'd buy something and you get the product registration card. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I always thought it was funny because you realize, wow, if I don't fill this out, they don't even know who I am. <laughs> yeah, right. And then the second one is a more recent experience. Last year I bought a solo stove. Have you ever seen those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I bought it on their website, but you know, they also have them at the hardware store, you know, down the street from mm -hmm. me. So either way, when you buy it, like you get on their email list and they just start hitting you with other stuff that you might want from them. And yeah. uh, it, it's actually been a good experience, even as a consumer, because I get to it, just like you said, it's like that brand. I'm now a fan of it and I'm interested in what other things they have to offer. Yeah. Yeah. It's solo stoves is a great example. Like their stoves are awesome. My, my brother-in-law, same thing. He bought a solo stove and now he owns like five or six of their products. And that first 
solo so we were just amazed with the you know there's the lack of smoke and you don't smell terrible when you go back into the house your wife's not forcing you to take a shower um but it, in that same email marketing like he would start every time i go over to the house he would have some new product whether it was like some kind of grate for cooking or you know all the different accessories that they sell yeah that's a fan he's a fan that's funny yeah yeah but but, you know, to your point, that's like almost like a, a down the road sell, right? And I mean, the manufacturer might even not be thinking about that at all yet. Mm -hmm. right? Sure. You know, just trying to get them in the door still. But I, I like your point to Avar about a digital agency. And another thing I was thinking of is just the content engine, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of it is just writing. Some companies just don't even know what to write about their products. And they, you almost are in a, in my opinion, you're almost in a better position not knowing the products because mm -hmm. now you're thinking yeah. like someone who's going to hit the website, right? And so yeah. that digital agency normally, now correct me if I'm wrong, but normally they'll have a team or people they use to actually just generate the content, which can be very time consuming. Is that yeah, true? That's right. Yeah. So, so content marketing is outrageously important. Like you can't, you can't um, minimize how important it is because everything web-based is based around content. Right. So the more content you have, the more frequency of your posts, um, uh, the more traction you're going to get on the website. And to your point about the questions, the questions are gold. So if you can understand the questions people are asking that surround your product, then you know exactly what content to produce that Google is going to return when people search for that question. So Google has um, keyword tools. I'm not sure if you've seen these before, but Google has a keyword tool where you can go and insert a bunch of keywords and it'll return um, uh, data on how often those terms are searched for, how often questions are searched for, uh, the amount of competition across all the web of answers to these particular questions. So you can basically do yourself a favor and just build a list of 20 different articles that you know people are searching for answers on, produce that content and put it on your web it's, it doesn't happen overnight. Your content has to basically index with Google for like six months, and they're using other metrics to see how often people are linking to your site, how often is your site being shared via email, uh, is it showing up in social media? Like all of that's important for Google to give your domain authority. And then once you have that authority, that's what bumps you up on the search engine results. And if you figure out how to play that game, there's a great book called... Um, Epic content marketing. Um, I think Joe Pol Joe Polozzi, I think is how you pronounce his name. Um, he he wrote this book and a series of other books about content marketing. But epic content marketing is all about B two B marketing uh, with the web. And I mean, he just lays out the plan like it's a blueprint for exactly what businesses need to do. And so, if I'm the manufacturer who says everything you just said sounds awesome, I don't even know where to start. Is mm -hmm. that where you just say digital agency? Yes. They're going to walk you through that and help you with all that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know how to, okay. you, you don't need to know how to do any of this. You're exactly right. There are agencies out there, you know, there are small agencies that specialize in certain topics. And then there are larger agencies that are comparable to like an ad agency, just anything digital, whether it's videos, podcasts, photography, content development, website design, they'll just do it whatever it is that you need to make your brand successful online. Cool. Well, that's great background. I mean, I, I personally am very interested in the whole e-commerce area. Don't have a lot of experience with it though. So, uh, you know, th this is mainly me probing you with questions. Hopefully the <laughs> listener finds it interesting as well, but I guess we should be true to our title. So maybe uh, we could turn the corner now before we get to Shopify B2B, maybe just talk in general about what's the difference between, or what is B2B e-commerce and and then why does Shopify even have a separate product or at least a separate brand around it? Why not just build those features into Shopify as like additional charge features? Like why the need for this Shopify B2B thing? Sure. So um, first of all, the difference is um, in the B2C world, if you, if you take uh, 10 B2C merchants, and you look at all the use cases that they have and all the features that they need and what their expectations are in selling, nine of the 10 are going to be very much the same. They're going to be very similar. And then that, that 10th one 
might have some unique workflows or unique um, use cases that need to be met, right? And what that means is you can build one, pro one product and then out of the box, that one product will satisfy 90% of B2C merchants. And Shopify has proven that, right? For the last 10 years, I would say Shopify and Big Commerce both have done a good job proving that. Um, in the B2B world, it's the opposite. You take 10 B2B merchants and you compare what their needs are and maybe two of them will be the same and everybody else has very unique needs or expectations. Um, you take something like customer specific pricing, like every B2B uh, e-commerce merchant is going to expect their customers to log into the site. And as soon as they're looking at your products, you want them to see the products in the prices that you intend to sell them to that particular customer. All right, but 10 different businesses might handle customer pricing in 10 different ways. Some of them, they just group everybody into like three tiers. Some of them, every single buyer has a different rate, whether they're in the same company or not, they, they may have different percentages. Um, some of them have groups that have no customer pricing at all, but the customers that have been around for a long time, they have specific pricing, but there's changes there. My, my point is that instead of having these out of the box tools where you just check a box and it works, you need configuration. You need the ability to configure prices for all these different customer types. That's just one example. The other thing in, in B2B. Can I ask you there real quick? Yeah, sure. So that, that sounds to me then like Acumatica and that in my opinion, Acumatica is more of a platform than an application. Is that is that kind of similar where Shopify is like an application, maybe Shopify to B2B has more of a platform element. I've got uh, utilities and engines I can use to yeah. configure what I want instead of just what you see is what you get. Yeah, so they're, um, from a Shopify perspective, they're starting with the same base. So that same intuitive interface that they have for building out websites is what the um, Shopify B2B edition starts with, but they're adding in additional features, which include all these configuration tools that allow you to create the customer experience that you're expecting. That your customers Do you know expecting. code wise is it like a if i think of it like a, a developer is it like a fork in the project or is it like functionality that's sitting on top of the regular shopify um they would have to answer that question to to be absolutely um accurate but my impression is that it's just it's not a fork it's it's basically shopify with additional features built on top of it got it okay yeah and if that's their long-term plan, I'm not sure. Um, but but my understanding is right now that it's not a fork. But it does feel like, at least from what you've seen, it does feel like Shopify. It doesn't feel like, you know, like in the ERP world, we see this all the time. You have like same product name with advanced or something at the end. Yeah. And it's some completely different product that they acquired and it has nothing to do with the <laughs> regular product on the technology side. But Shopify, you feel like, it is the same product and they're building out the that's B2B right. functionality. Yeah, okay. it's basically you log in, it's the same Shopify that's been there for years now, except there are additional features in the sidebar. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, keep going. I was just, just clarifying my understanding. Oh, no problem. So, um, oh yeah, so the customer needs are different, which requires B2B e-commerce to be different. Um, and your other question was, so you asked me what's the difference between B to C and B to B, and I can't remember the second question now. Um, well, it just, I mean, it. I'm just in my own head trying to get the picture. It does seem like it. It. Uh, I like the configuration response there. That mm -hmm. it is, you've got to have tools that you can configure. Mm -hmm. Not to me, what you see is what you get. That that does make sense. Maybe mm -hmm. that's your enterprise description on it as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, no, so that, B2 yeah, just just B to C and B to B in general is what I was trying to get an understanding of, and I that that's helpful. Yeah, the, at the end of the day, B to B is just more complex. You know, like you're you're gonna have to sit down with the the seller and really understand what their expectations are around the workflow, how data is flowing back and forth between, in our case, between Acumatica and the e-commerce platform, and um, what all those special expectations are, like customer specific pricing or different payment terms, or what kind of rules are we going to set on purchases 
based on their account terms, things like that. It goes a little deeper. And so, so Shopify has been around, I think you were bringing it up around 2008 time frame. Yeah, I think 2000, about, right? I think 2008 to 2010 is when it started to really get traction. I'm not, yeah, you'd have to double check that, but it was around that so, period. Somewhere of time. around there. Yeah. But then Shopify B2B is what in the last year mm -hmm. or five years or? Yeah. So they officially announced it in July uh, of this summer. So July oh, 22. Just a couple months ago. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So they've been, they've been working on it for, um, you know, a year and a half or two years. And um, they, we, we had, we've had a relationship with Shopify for several years now. And when they started heading in this B2B direction, uh, they reached out to us and asked for a couple of use cases. And, you know, they wanted to know if we would meet with their product team and answer a couple questions. And, uh, you know, what was going to be a 30 minute call turned into like an hour and a half of our team talking to them about what the world of manufacturing and distribution looked like and how an e-commerce system should be prepared for that world. And I'm telling you, like, you know how, I, I'm not sure if you've experienced this or not, but I've always, I've had people call me and ask for advice and, and I give them a lot of advice. And then as soon as the phone hangs up, it's like that advice is forgotten and they just can continue moving on. With Shopify, we gave them some input and some advice. And then three months later, we got an email asking us to a second meeting. And in that second meeting, they showed us the results of every piece of advice that we gave them. And I was like, holy cow. Like really for me, that is what uh, put in stone like the strength of the partnership, right? The fact that they trusted everything that we shared with them and they took what we said seriously enough that they built it into the product. So um, there were quite a few design decisions that were made by those conversations. In, in addition to that, Shopify brought in a lot of B2B experts who had worked in the B2B e-commerce space um, prior, and they brought their knowledge to the table as well. And um, I mean, it's been great to, to work with them and, and see what they're doing. That's very cool. Yeah. So you, you're kind of in on the ground floor of this, it sounds like, pretty uh, close to it. Yeah, we, we were, uh, I think because we took them so seriously. You know, Shopify is, um, it's a very intuitive, easy system to use. Like I said, I mean, if you wanted to spin up a Shopify site, I'm confident that sometime in October you could be selling products online, right? It's a very easy system to work with. And in the B2B world, that is heavily desired. Um, B2B e-commerce is a very complex topic, right? That's why you have systems like uh, Optimizely and Oro Commerce and some of these, what I call big boy B2B e-commerce platforms, which are super robust, very flexible, and they are just, you know, overflowing with B2B oriented features, but they're, they are going to require an agency. Like there is absolutely no way that you're going to implement an Oro commerce product on your own. And with Shopify, those manufacturers that we were talking about earlier that just want to dip their toe in online sales, like Shopify could be that system for them where they maybe they have an agency that's helping but they will have the ability to go in and make adjustments and changes and configurations and the system will make sense to the people that are using it and i think that's going to open up a whole new paradigm of b2b online sales i think it's going to make a big difference and then at the end of the day it's going to benefit all these other b2b commerce platforms because like 2012 that's when i started having this conversation and we had just been waiting for the technology to catch up with what the market was demanding. And now we're entering that phase. And those Optimizely and, and Oro Commerce and, you know, Unilog, there's a bunch of like systems that were specifically built for B2B distributors and wholesalers. Um, those are great for the, the companies that are just doing millions and millions and millions in B2B sales online year in and year out. They have very specific needs. You don't want to start there. Nobody wants to pay that kind of license fee and that kind of agency fee just to dip their toe. And um, I guess Shopify is kind of filling that gap. But your gut feel, at least now, 
a, just a couple months into this new Shopify B2B. Uh, it's if you, I find that small manufacturer looking to dip my toe, I don't need to start with Shopify first and then look at Shopify B2B. I just go right to Shopify B2B. Um, I mean, it depends on what their needs are. Like if, if you were going to test out uh, D to C sales, you could just go to Shopify first. Um, if you wanted the B2B features and functionality like we were talking about before, yeah, that's going to involve a phone call to Shopify, um, sharing a bit about your requirements, making sure that the system has everything that you're going to need, and then um, you would jump right into that B2B edition. Yeah. And so that's an official... Oh, sorry, go ahead. And the, the other thing I would say is I'm just telling you what, I'm, what I know based on the conversations I've had with Shopify. They could change any of this at any time. You know, it may be something that anybody could go sign up for on their own. Um, I just haven't seen that yet. Maybe that's next year. Yeah, we're a bit on the bleeding edge here, right? Things could change Absolutely. at yeah. any moment. Yeah. So speaking of bleeding edge, it sounds like uh, Shopify B2B is a real official thing now as of a couple months ago. What about the Acumatica then integration to Shopify B2B? Is that a real thing yet or what's that look like? So it's a work in progress. We had to wait until their, um, the API endpoints were ready for us. So as I mentioned, we worked with them through the process. We had regular meetings with their team to see how things were going. We talked about certain use cases and um, how they would be met with our two systems. Um, my impression is Shopify was doing this with other uh, businesses as well, but I, I, I just know our relationship with them was really strong. So whenever, whenever the work was done, we basically had that head start to understand what they were going to accomplish. So um, as soon as they announced it, uh, that was right as we were wrapping up R2, uh, 2022 R2. So now then we moved into Q3 and the BAs started working on the specs. Um, I know some of the features are already complete for 23R1 and uh, we're going to integrate with as much of it as we can uh, in 23R1. And then as Shopify continues to add new tools, you know, we'll, they'll be on the docket for us to hook into as well. So the goal at this point is to have some Shopify B2B bullet points in the release notes for 2023 R1, like official yes. stuff that's there. That's right. Okay, cool. And is there anything similar I have no idea. Is there anything similar on the big commerce side? Is there like a big commerce B2B? Oh yeah, definitely. So big commerce, um, they actually had, they've had B2B features in big commerce, um, I think since 2016 or 2017. Really what they had was customer specific pricing. And my understanding is that they recognized early that B2B businesses were going to want to sell online. And the most frequently requested feature was customer specific pricing. So um, out of the gates, almost out of the gates, big commerce added that functionality in their solution. Um, and then they spent some time working on the um, multi storefront um, uh, configuration of big commerce, which allows you to operate one admin panel inside big commerce but you could launch products on as many stores as you want, right? So you're only managing a product one time, but you're telling it which stores. This comes in really handy for brands that have, you know, one umbrella company with many brands under it that are all selling the same products. Um, so they wrapped that up. They released that earlier this year. It was officially released. And um, I mean, they're shifting a lot of resources into B2B now. So like they have a whole B2B division. Um, I'm good friends with the director of B2B at Big Commerce. I've known him for years and have a ton of faith in um, what he's going to do, but they have big plans as well. And I think that um, the robustness of Big Commerce's B2B solution is um, it's going to be impressive as well. They've gone through a couple acquisitions and they brought in a lot of team members who have uh, history in B2B. So you could use big commerce for B2B today, certainly. And I think it's just going to get better. So this is still, you know, new on the Shopify side 
and this is not a comprehensive look at things, but just from what you've seen so far, what are some differentiators? Is it price point? Is it, you know, what's the difference between B2B on the Shopify side versus B2B on the big commerce side? I don't know. I, I try my best to remain agnostic about the two. And I mean, you have these, these two massive companies who are obviously competitors and I have uh, really strong relationships with both of them. Right. So I always, uh, um, I, I have jokes about managing those two relationships, but um, <laughs> when I, when I look at the two as platforms, both of them are very good, strong platforms. It's really up to the end user to sit down and spend some time with both platforms and then make a decision about what is best for their company, which platform is their uh, employee base going to be more comfortable in. Um, as far as like feature parity at this point, they're very close to each other. Um, you would have to dig around to find some differences. And some of those differences are, I mean, frankly, they're kind of minute. Like, like if you look at big commerce and how it handles product category structure, it's handled differently inside of Shopify. And it would be up to the business to decide which one of those two is most appropriate, right? Do we want to have this automated tagging system that is less rigid or do we want a very rigid um, category system because our products, the, the number of SKUs are so massive that we want to control everything um, without the automation doing it for us because we're afraid that things could um, go in the wrong places. Those are the kinds of decisions you have to make. And that's exactly why a digital agency is important. They'll come in and listen to the manufacturer or distributor talk about what their needs are and then say, okay, from our experience, we think you need to lean this way. I like that. You did a great job of staying in your lane. I've had hunting years that of practice. <laughs> I've had years of practice. <laughs> Put that to the marketing agency. That makes sense. Yeah. So that kind of even comes back to that same point again, to the, you know, you need the digital agency on this journey. If I'm the manufacturer and it's like, ah, oh, now I've got another thing I need to decide on big commerce, Shopify, which one? Well, no, you just have one thing to decide on, pick a digital agency and let them lead you through that process. Yeah. And they're definitely, I don't, I don't want to um, ignore the VARs in our community that have agencies built into them. There are quite a few VARs that have acquired agencies or built agencies inside the organization. So they're fully capable of talking about uh, both topics um, intelligently. Um, and even if you're, even if you're listening to this and you're engaged with a VAR today that you know doesn't have those resources, I, those VARs have everything that they need to build the relationships with agencies and bring them into the picture. And even if they're having trouble with that, all you have to do is reach out to Actimatica. I mean, I have a, I, I could just send a text message to a half dozen people and um, get them on the phone. Well, now it makes sense to me. Yeah, if you're in that situation, you're with the VAR, who doesn't quite have that built out yet, you're much better off going on that journey with the VAR rather than Absolutely. independently on your own, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. Because you're going to learn from each other. You're going to benefit from each other. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because Acumatic is going to be hooked into the e-commerce platform, from my perspective, the VAR has to be involved. They at least need to be involved in the conversations uh, from the beginning because the way you configure... the the customer experience that is desired on the e-commerce platform is founded in the configuration of data inside the ERP. You know, for example, there, there were some um, uh, manufacturers that we worked with back in like 2020 that was using an old format for products with variants inside of Acumatica. They were using like a parent-child relationship. They weren't using matrix inventory. And a VAR would have known you need to transfer everything over to matrix inventory in order to have products and variants on the website. A digital agency would not even think to ask that question, right? They would, they would just say, oh, you sell t-shirts. That's a product with variant, no problem. Um, but it's, you know, the VARs are going to have those levels of understanding that are very important. That's a great example. I like that. What about on the, so you did a good job of um, 
navigating the the relationships with big commerce <laughs> and Shopify. What if I throw a competitor at you? Um, you know, I'll play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Acumatica's got two strong relationships with big commerce and Shopify. I know you've got Magento and maybe even more as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why so many options? Uh, I like NetSuite because NetSuite appears at least to have one just built in and it's super simple. What What are some, you know, play up Acumatica strengths here? I mean, what, what are reasons why you want multiple e-commerce relationships rather than just going with one horse? Well, first of all, that one horse is uh, on its last leg, I would say. Um, I don't, I, I think that, um, it seems to me that NetSuite is coming to the realization that they can't build an e-commerce platform better than the major players. And it'll be interesting to see how long that software stays around. And if I were a buyer today, that would be a major concern I would have that I'm investing in something that's not going to be here uh, for much longer. Um, when it comes to the actual integrations, um, like our team, we have a team of 20 people on the retail commerce team that solely focus on integrations between these external platforms and Acumatica. That's what we do day in and day out. Just how is data passing back and forth? What are the customer experiences people are uh, needing? And how do we build those? Um, NetSuite's solution to that problem was to buy a um, an iPaaS system. And they're, they're selling that iPaaS system as a native integration. And it will, it'll integrate NetSuite to um, Shopify, BigCommerce, any of these platforms. Um, the problem with an external iPaaS system, iPaaS totally makes sense for some merchants, right? If a merchant is hooking Acumatica into 40 different platforms, and all 40 of those can be managed in an iPaaS, like Soligo is one of our partners and they do really well. Totally right. makes sense that they would do that. Um, sometimes a, a customer just needs to, uh, they're, not, they're not concerned with all the bells and whistles. All they want are for Shopify orders to become sales orders in the ERP. Nothing else is important to them. An iPaaS solution makes total sense. But when you're talking to a customer that they, they really need everything to be seamless. And maybe they even need to extend the connection functionality. That's when the native integration starts to make sense. Because not only we have these native integrations of BigCommerce and Shopify, and now Amazon, but that connector framework is open. So the partners can actually access the framework. And one, they can duplicate the framework and use it for whatever system they want. They could build integrations to other e-commerce platforms, but they could also go in and look at the code and extend it even further. So if a customer has um, some very unique custom need and a customization has to be built for Acumatica to satisfy that need, through our commerce framework, you could extend the framework to work with the customization, right? So it's, it's flexible. That's, I guess, flexible is the word here. Um, we just understand that a lot of businesses aren't exactly the same and, and we need a flexible system in order to satisfy everybody. Okay. Can I ask that on that then is, um, is what you're talking about there extending, I actually didn't know you could do that. Is that a customization project? in the framework and you're writing C sharp code or doing some low code, no code stuff. What does that look like? So, um, first I would say I'm not enough of an engineer to talk about this, um, uh, technically, but basically my, my understanding is I'm just repeating what I've heard Sergey say is the packages inside Acumatica's core are accessible. And within the commerce connector framework, there's several directories. One directory represents our connector for Shopify. One represents the connector for big commerce, and those are built on top of our connector framework. The big commerce um, connection directory essentially can be duplicated. You had, you'd have to open up that code and swap out 
all of the big commerce API endpoints for whatever other e-commerce platform, their API endpoints. But we have a lot of functions and methods written in the connector itself to handle, you know, if a sales order is coming in, it's not like the sales order just comes in, you dump it into the window. There's actually many different functions that have to happen to check inventory and check information, see if the customer's in the system already or if they need to be added. There's all these different things that need to happen. That's baked into the connector framework. And then the Shopify connection, big commerce connection, they just sit on top of the connector framework. So gotcha. there's no reason why a partner can't duplicate that. And we've seen a half dozen partners do just that. They've built integrations to platforms like Vtex and uh, Oral Commerce is building one now. And uh, manufacturing team has actually used the technology to build integrations to other systems. So it's becoming our internal iPaaS tool, I guess. Yeah, that's a good way of describing it, internal iPaaS. And so for even Shopify B2B, you're leveraging the same framework. So it's not like you're coding this integration from scratch. That's right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, I want to respect your time. I know we're coming up to the top of the hour here, but any other quick. <laughs> parting thoughts on e-commerce or Shopify B2B or? Um, I Well, I don't know if I have any parting thoughts. What I would say is if you have, if you're listening to this and you have questions, um, just reach out like whether you're reaching out to us or reaching out to the VAR uh, personally I could talk about this topic until I'm blue in the face and one of my honestly one of my favorite things in the world is meeting a new business that has a really interesting business structure and then figuring out how to make them successful online like what what is the path that you're going to have to take in order to give your customers the experiences that they want in order for you to be successful. I have I have those conversations every week and they're my favorite. Um, so if you're questioning this, just reach out to us. It, either whether you're talking to a VAR or you're talking to us directly, um, this is a topic that we sincerely help, sincerely love helping customers with and we do it all the time. Cool. Do you have another 10, 15 minutes? I can keep going, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I. Um, you know, first time, I think first time I saw you was probably on stage at an Acumatica summit, probably right after. Did you come on to Acumatica like right before a summit? Like maybe the fall before? Oh, yeah, that's right. So I like started that. in October in 2018. And then in 2019, I was on stage at the um, Houston summit. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely got that sense that uh, you are passionate about this stuff. And you, you've got a... I don't know what the right word for it is, but I feel like you have a solution approach to it, you know, rather than a technology approach to it. Oh, and that yeah. you're not hung up on one specific technology. I even thought it was funny with your background. You mentioned Flash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, that Steve Jobs kills Flash, right? But yeah. that didn't kill your interest in the area because you're not hung up on one technology. I mean, maybe yeah. that's my interpretation. That's right. Right. Actually, the flash Where taught that... me not to marry myself to anything. I mean, that Interesting. I, was, I was at the Adobe conference in 2007 where Adobe was talking about their partnership with Apple in which Apple was going to accept flash on mobile devices. And from my perspective, I was like, awesome. I can start making mobile devices. I can, I could build a whole business around that. And then I don't know if you know that story, but you're right. Steve I Jobs. Don't. He just killed it. He So my favorite part, this is one of my favorite. Within months? Yeah, yeah to, I don't know the detail of that. So, so basically, Adobe had been trying to warm Apple up to allowing Flash to run. And Steve Jobs didn't want any required plugins in order to access content in a mobile device. He was like, this is ridiculous. You're not, you don't have to install plugins to access information. Everything you're doing, we could do with JavaScript you know, basically flashes junk. That was his attitude about it, right? So then Adobe, they take out a one page ad in the New York Times and all it says is, uh, we heart Apple, right? Steve Jobs, the following week, buys the same one page ad and it, and you know the icon you'd see when the flash 
item wasn't running. It was just like a box with a little question mark in the middle. He takes out a one page ad and it just says, I question mark box, uh, Adobe. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, like the brilliance of that man, it goes way beyond technology. It was like the most brilliant way to shut them down. And that's when it was over. It was, that was, that was the end of it. And then I was like, well, I guess I'm gonna have to learn JavaScript now. <laughs> <laughs> and that was around like 2008. Yeah. Some, sometime around that. I, yeah. I actually did not know that. So like 2008 is always in my head. Cause that's right around the time that Acumatica started. Mm -hmm. And there was always this HTML five from the very beginning, yeah. but I didn't have the timeline to that with flash. It was. That was the trigger to HTML5 then. Yeah, that's I mean, right. Steve Jobs triggered it. Yeah, Interesting. So, so I didn't know those details. Adobe was building this <laughs> technology called a Adobe Flex, which was, it was a um, application builder. I mean, it was like working with um, Eclipse or anything else that you would use to assemble an application. And their intentions were to take Flex and make that a programming platform to build things like Acumatica. And Apple just killed it. I mean... <laughs> it must have been a sad day for those developers. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah so you're, you can just tell that approach that you're not married to any one technology and you're interested in the solution side. So I was curious about is, you know, without getting into non-disclosure stuff, I mean, what, what's like a project that you've, you know, if you could describe it vaguely enough, you know, what's a project that you've worked or a company that you've worked with at Acumatica without even saying the name, you know, talk about the details of the kind of stuff that you like to work on and one that you felt went really well and why it went really well. Oh, I could talk about a few. I, okay. So there's one, one of my favorite stories to tell. Okay. So let me back up a minute. One, one thing that, Oh, Oh, and pick a manufacturer. If, if that's one of the ones in your head, if it's not, then don't worry about it. Okay. So I can, um, Okay, so let, let me think about that. Let me tell this story. This is not a manufacturer in the sense that they use Acumatic as manufacturing software. They actually do their manufacturing offshore, and they bring it in, and then they sell it in the U.S. But what I liked about them is they were all digital natives. So this is, this is the trend that I'm seeing. Um, so uh, Shopify became popular in 2008. Um, a lot of smart people had ideas for products and they started selling those products out of their garage through Shopify. Some of those businesses took off and they went from garage businesses to now being 30 million to a hundred million dollar businesses. And those businesses are led by people that know nothing about the supply chain. They don't know distribution. They don't understand ERP. A lot of times I have to explain to them what an ERP is. Um, I call all of them digital natives because they've, they've taken these web-based tools and they've figured out how to use those tools to build a business. And then they've built that business into, you know, an enterprise, something fantastic. Well, those, those digital natives, they want to get their hands on technology as soon as possible so they can figure out what they can do with the technology to make it work in their favor, right? And a lot of these Shopify businesses that we meet, even the, the big commerce businesses as well, they are all digital natives. So when we go through the standard sales process with them that we do at Acumatica with manufacturers and distributors who are totally accustomed to PowerPoint slides and sales conversations and engaging, these digital natives, they don't want anything to do with that. What they want is for you to set them up with Acumatica, allow them to hook it into Big Commerce or Shopify and just play with it. Like literally, just let me play with it, right? Well, we had a digital native a uh, brand that came to us two years ago, in the fall, two years ago. It was a Shopify merchant. Dur during the real crunch of COVID supply yes, chain issues. That's, that's that exactly sense. right. Okay. So, yeah. so yeah. everything went haywire. They were running on QuickBooks, quickly realized we need off QuickBooks as soon as possible. Um, and they, were, they had been on Shopify and the business was growing rapidly, right? Uh, they contact us and we're having a great conversation. I'm getting, you know, demos and, you know, talking about everything that can be done. And uh, we're saying, okay, we're going to find you a VAR and set you up with a VAR so that they can help you implement this. And they're like, no, there's no way that we're working with a VAR. We're going to do this ourselves. 
And everybody in Acumatic, we're so accustomed to VARs helping customers through the process that not having a VAR just seemed foreign and dangerous. And what we ended up agreeing with them on was, okay, we'll set you up with a VAR. Uh, the VAR will be there, your point of contact to help you with anything that you have challenges with. Um, but the VAR, in this case, the VAR agreed to basically be their support system while they implemented the solution on their own. And we all kind of sat back and like hope for the best. Uh, you know, yeah, we did a lot luck. of calls yeah. with them and everything. I was optimistic, um, but it was kind of, I don't want to say it was an experiment, but it's what they wanted to do. And we got behind them, right? Four months later, they're live. Four months later, they're live with the system. It's integrated with Shopify. Um, they spent about a month training the team on all the new software. There was some kinks that need to be worked out, just like any project. You have like two months of stabilization. And um, after that two months were over, they just started scaling rapidly. And to watch a digital native brand implement the solution themselves and make it a success, that was like very eye-opening for me. And now I'm wondering... I see all these Shopify businesses that are in that $5 million range, like one to 5 million. And they're starting to realize <clears throat> that QuickBooks isn't gonna cut it for them for long. And a big question that I'm asking is how do we replicate what we did in the past? Like, obviously we, we need the VARs. The VARs are not going anywhere. They're always gonna be part of Acumatica and our ecosystem. But is there a model where the VARs can be coaches to these do-it-yourself digital natives and they can implement themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, that's been heavily on my mind. Okay, so that project I, I absolutely love talking about. Interesting. As far as the manufacturers, um, yeah, there there were some manufacturers that bought in the early date, like 2019, early 2020, right when the product was being released. And um, what I found was there were very innovative and thoughtful entrepreneurs that knew they needed to be selling online and they had very complex businesses. And when they heard about the flexibility of Acumatica and the flexibility of these e-commerce platforms, um, they wanted to hook the two together and uh, basically be off to the races. In, in this particular project, it was super complex needs, like everything down to uh, individually configurable products required a lot of extra development. Um, but the team stuck it out and they went live over the summer. It took a long time. I mean, it's two year implementation. It was a very large company and they had very complex products, um, but now they're selling online and in their industry, nobody else is doing this, like to the level that they are. And they're, they're in an industry where service providers are out in the field and they need to buy replacement parts for whatever problem they're trying to fix. And with their mobile phone, they can pull it out. They can take dimensions. They can put in the dimensions on the phone. They can check out with their account terms. Order goes in and then, you know, the product shows up in a couple of days. Sometimes the product's like custom made for them. Um, but seeing a business like that in an industry where the web was not that important, be able to take off and start to grow uh, because they're, in my opinion, properly using these web tools to the way that they should be used. I think that's, uh, you know, 10 years from now, it's going to be, you know, a dull moment. Like, yeah, obviously everybody should be doing this, but it's neat to watch these innovators go live. I'm curious on that one. You said it took about two years to do that. Yeah. Uh, was it like the big bang approach where there was nothing until two years or was it like a, let's sell 5% of our products, at least get something on the store that people can yeah. do and then grow it from there. So they, they went live with Acumatica very quickly and they started using Acumatica for the back office of their business. So that piece was live within months. Um, the implementation of getting Acumatica, number one, the owner, he had um, very big ideas of what a perfect customer experience should be like. And that required a lot of custom development. Um, 
mainly on the e-commerce side, um, a little bit on the Acumatica side, but that that's where a lot of the time was spent in building out those customizations, getting everything just right. And, um, and then there was, you know, just months spent in testing to just make sure every corner of the application was working properly. Uh, that particular customer too, he, um, he was very concerned with going to market with something that was half baked. He wanted people to log in for the first time and find it so, um, so impactful, so positively impactful that they didn't even think about going to other, you know, competitors anymore. And so that was kind of his North star. That's what he was after. So the time it took to get there obviously was long. That's very atypical. That's definitely the longest project I've seen. But um, so that that one kind of sounds like the iPhone approach, and that he didn't want to unveil something that was that's right uh, wasn't going to wow you. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, we definitely brought that up many times. Like, look, here here's this subset of products that technically you could go live with today, and we could finish the rest of this work. And he didn't want that. He wanted a hundred percent of it. Um, all at the same time and yeah it's now live and working for them interesting very interesting yeah yeah i don't want to make the impression that all the projects are like that that it stands out in my mind because it was such a massive um project and a long ordeal but um i think you know my favorite my favorite projects are the ones where the VARs are able to sell the deal and it's interesting business, quite a bit of complexity. And the VAR is able to take the customer live in a short period of time and without any, um, without any handholding from us. When I see the VARs start to get their head wrapped around what these customers actually want and what their expectations are, they get into a rhythm. So like the first projects, new territory for them. So it's a little bit hard for them to get their head wrapped around what the customer expectations are. But once they get their head wrapped around all these different trends that they're seeing and all the different asks, and um, they learn about that new area of the industry, they get into a rhythm. And the first project's tough, second project's tough, third project, much easier, fourth, fifth, and sixth, they just start rolling out. So like, you know, it'd be interesting to see this on a graph, um, but basically they tighten up at the end and it's just repetitive. Yeah, I don't want to mention any names, but there are certain bars that I've seen that happen with. And now they're at a point where every other week I'm getting an email about a prospect and maybe detailed questions about what they need to do or whatever. But it's it's great to see them growing. That's cool. Yeah, I you've got kind of two sides. So you got the e-commerce side and you've got the ERP side. I would imagine that you've got deals that are led from either side. You've got some companies like the digital native who is totally fine on the e-commerce side, but they need the ERP side. Yeah. I'm sure you've got the reverse. You've got the manufacturer who's been running for years and doesn't know anything about e-commerce and you kind right. of different entry points, but the end result is the need to have this this seamless functionality between the front office and the back office. And yeah. when you say front office, I used to think of CRM, but you know, that's still like really designed to interface with the salesperson directly. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say front office, I think more e-commerce. Is that, is that the way you think as well? I think about anything that is customer engaging. So, mm -hmm. so front office is the, that's basically where the touch points with the customer exist. So it could be the website, it could be email marketing, it could be an, a brick and mortar store. Uh, we are, we're seeing a lot of manufacturers open up uh, trade room or trade show, I'm sorry, showroom floors where there people are coming in and seeing products and placing orders. So that's becoming more popular, but anything where the customer appears, in my opinion, is the customer facing front office. And then that back office is the back office is the machine that actually produces the value, right? Whether it's the products or it's the uh, accounting system or it's the fulfillment process or that's the, that is what the, um, the merchant is providing 
to those that are in that front office area. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, these different things that used to be separate worlds, tying them together, that's got to be pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And in ways that, you know, used to have, have to have separate systems and just the, the value you get out of that one version of the truth or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, that's got to be pretty cool for a company. And I could see how that would be, you know, really fulfilling on your end to work with on those types of projects. Oh, yeah, it absolutely is. It was a major pain point. Like like I said, 10 years ago, um, unless you were willing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, like there just weren't any good options for you. And um, to now be in a position where I'm talking with, you know, we, we have plenty of those very large customers, but it's not unusual now to be talking to those $5 million businesses with do it yourself, digital natives that realize QuickBooks isn't going to last forever. And I need to move to something um, better. And like, we have a solution for it. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. And that solution is going to last them through, you know, at least a decade if they, you know, continue to maintain it. It's like a car. You just got to change the oil. And um, yeah, that is really exciting. I think Acumatic is doing it right too. Like the the reason I'm here is because of the technology, because of the capabilities, the flexibility. Like, um, I mean, the the system was so I mean, you know this, but the system was so well engineered from the early days. Like they, in my opinion, they did it right. You know, they didn't come out of the gate focused on sales and marketing. They had to get the core solution right before they started pushing it, and that has paid off in dividends. It sounds like Shopify is kind of similar, been around for a while. And when they finally turn the corner into B2B, they're they're taking it really seriously, building features in based on your feedback, et cetera. But they got in a good core. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe their core is more on the user interface side, you know, that they got that really dialed in yeah. before adding the B2B complexity. Yeah. Yeah. They focus on things like page load, times. And um, I know, for instance, um, it it, it could be Black Friday and you're on a Shopify site and literally 100,000 people are placing an order within the same minute. And uh, actually both BigCommerce and Shopify, they pride themselves on the fact that their systems don't go down. Like that's a that's a metric for them. Right. And that's not an easy task you know, 100,000 people processing an order all within the same minute on an e-commerce store on Black Friday when everything's so busy, yeah. you can't, the system just can't go down. Interesting. So, you know, uh, Ac- Acumatica customer maybe who's on Shopify currently or, or, you know, interested even in kicking the tires on this new B2B, sounds like we're anticipating seeing something in 2023 r1 Mm -hmm. is there any type of program is it just reach out to you if someone's interested in beta testing something or providing feedback how does that look like yeah so what we've we've had a few customers reach out to us so far and what we've done is introduce them to the shopify team so that shopify can start introducing them to these new features and functionality and then um once once we're in a position where a, a beta can be spun up and um you know a demo environment can be shared then then we'll be happy to do that but like i said happy to talk to anybody that has questions awesome well hey thanks for taking the time today to give us uh your view of e-commerce in general and and also the shopify b2b i appreciate it it was great conversation thanks hi there uh this is josh fisher again Um, I hope you enjoyed that great conversation with Tim. I really enjoyed having that conversation. I just wanted to share this uh, tidbit with you. So two days after the conversation with Tim, I got an email from Shopify saying that they needed to make some changes to the API uh, related to price lists in the the, uh, new B2B features. Um, The reason that I'm kind of posting this disclaimer after the video is because in the conversation with Tim, I stated that Shopify B2B would be supported in 23R1, and I should have followed that up with anything could change, especially when you're building integrations with other companies' platforms. Um, We obviously don't have control over their roadmap or their timeline, uh, but we do work very closely with them. They understand our roadmap and our plans and timeline, so we're trying to work together 
um, to get these features out as quickly as possible to you. Um, so that's a long way of saying that uh, what I said in the conversation with Tim could change over time, but we're honestly, we're doing our best to um, get these features out to customers and future customers as soon as possible. If you have any questions, uh, you can learn more on Acumatica.com or community.acumatica.com. That's where we have conversations with our customers and partners, um, or you could just reach out to us directly. Uh, we love talking to people and uh, we'll be happy to talk with you. All right, so thanks a lot. All right, well, that's it for now. We'll catch you on the next episode of AUGforums.com Real Talk. Thanks for listening and take care.